in two minutes, I'll ask to have the bell rung, or one minute. Good morning to all of you. This has been a different start this morning for me. I've had so many delightful interchanges with members of the congregation and the help that they have offered and so on. And I was just going to talk about the announcements per se. Thank you to the uh, Coffee Hour hosts, Anna Quattrusi and Aaron uh, Niehoff and Nancy Legassi for greeting. We're very appreciative for all the interaction that we get from our members. And today, if, forget the birthday month, forget it uh, for a minute. Anyway, heat may be a problem, so if you need to leave your jacket. It's come on. It's come on. Heat will not be a problem. We're all, we're all, well, we're all fired up inside. It'll be warm by the time we leave. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. And one thing I want to mention, uh, when we listen to the prelude, just let's take time to be at peace here, to take time to just reflect a little bit and prepare ourselves for worship. That would be delightful. And then there, uh, I have several other announcements, and one lastly, uh, Aaron announced it. Today we celebrate the October birthdays, Reverend Kim, Sidney Farr, Josh Bernard, Mike Stiletta, Steve Russell, and Marge Burgess. <clears throat> Someone forgot somebody. Inconsequential. <laughs> they're, trying, they're trying to get me, get, get me going. Anyway, yes, we are all Librans together, and we share certain qualities. I won't get into them, but anyway, we do. And I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I've had a delightful time with family and little guys. So, but I have one little great-granddaughter that's the same birthday as mine. She's one. She's one year old, and she's a button. But her sister's a button. Her sister is Tiddlywinks one. She's Tiddlywinks two. I name I name all our, I name our children. I'm not nice anyway. Uh, <laughs> but I I try to have fun with with everybody. And then uh, I've read the birthdays and I've read the announcements. And there are two meetings this week on when on Thursday at five o'clock the deacons will be meeting here and at six o'clock the council will be meeting. And I know as far as the deacons are concerned, we have many things to discuss and, and pull together because we like to represent all of us well. So now,
Thank you for your announcements. I appreciate it. I've got news from the pews that I wrote a long time ago. But I, I thank you very much. I have one as well. Yes. Just a quickie. In two weeks, on um, October 29th, that Sunday, we'll be celebrating All Saints Day. Um, so we'll have candles that you can, you can come up and light and say someone's name or not, or ask us to say the name. Uh, whatever works best for you. So just giving you a heads up about that because sometimes people want to know that in advance. Thank you. As I ignite the candles, let's listen to the prelude that Josh is going to play and get us into the spirit of worship. Join me, please, to the, and the call to worship. Children of God, welcome. Welcome to this place of love and grace. Welcome to this place of hope and perseverance. God invites all of us to be part of the beloved community. God invites all of us to share in the good news. In gratitude for all this, let us worship God. Trusting in God's forgiveness, let us in silence confess our failings and acknowledge our part in the pain of the world. Before God, with the people of God, I confess to turning away from God in the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God, God forgive, forgive you, Christ forgive you, you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Up. Oh, second half.
lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Amen. think any of us were wounded by having that chord played early. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized this morning, you may be seated, when I, oh, let me, when I got to the um, Tibetan Falls that I forgot my prop for this morning. So I'm going to find a substitute. Hmm. I don't see one of my puppets over here. Okay. Oh, there we go. It was hiding. Okay, so I was going to bring Herphy. Herphy was my um, childhood um, stuffed animal. So I wanted to talk about uh, comfort, right? So when we think about things that give us comfort, that Maybe that stuffed animal or that blanket that you had when you were very young and you took it with you everywhere. How many of you, how, well, probably most of us had one of those items. How many of you remember having one of those items? Yeah. Herphy came with me to camp, so that made things a lot easier, right? I could tuck him away. So, but today we're going to use a, a, a butterfly as our, our comfort item. And it's to remind us that when things are scary, you can, you can take your comfort item and, and hold it and feel a little bit better, right? And as adults, we don't do that as much. But I will admit, I remember when I was um, serving my very first church in Forks, Washington, and I would drive over, because it's four hours away, I would drive over either Friday or Saturday and preach on Sunday and then drive back. There was a ferry boat ride involved in this as well. That was kind of fun. But here's the thing. One time, one Saturday night I got there and there was this big thunderstorm and I was scared. And I'm not normally scared of thunderstorms, so I was like, what's going on? I was used to calming down my dog and my children. Oh, it's not a big deal. And I didn't have anyone to calm down. And there's something about calming down your dog that keeps you from freaking out about the thunderstorm. I mean, my biggest concern was if it was too much rain, if there was a landslide, I wouldn't be able to get home. We might not have power for worship, those kind of things. But you know, the brain starts spinning. So sometimes you just need something to focus on for comfort. And the psalm for today is one of those psalms. And I thought maybe we should pull it up. Because I think we all know it. I know it's a little small. But, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, 
and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Sometimes we just need a little comfort from the scriptures. And as adults, we can understand this and understand that it's also like that comforting object. Because when we were little, when we were babies and toddlers, that comfort object helped connect us to the people who gave it to us and cared for us. And this, this psalm connects us to the, that memory, that idea of God who loves and cares for and comforts us. And I think we need that right now. All right, on to our scriptures. Good morning. The first scripture reading is from Isaiah, and it is the song of praise. O oh Lord, you are my God, I exalt you, I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, formed plans of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin, and a place of foreigners is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthlessness, nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthlessness was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of foreigners like heat in a dry place. Like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with a shade of clouds. The song of ruthlessness was stilled. On this mountain of the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. He will destroy on this mountain the shroud that has cast over the peoples, the covering that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. He will be sad on that day. See, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. From the second scripture reading, Matthew 22, 1 to 14, which is paying taxes to the church. Nope. Yes? Nope. I, no, all the right. The parable of the wedding banquet. Whoops, I've got That's to, next week. <laughs> whoops, I, oh. Sometimes mistakes are made. I will try to correct my faults. <laughs> you have not harmed us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. The parable of the wedding banquet. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited. Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away in his form, another to, another to his business while the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed these murderers, and burned their cities. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding was ready, but those invited were not worthy. So go therefore to the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they had found both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. 
But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Here endeth the reading of the lesson. So I assume that this parable is probably not anyone here's favorite parable. <laughs> it's a challenging parable what, that leaves you going, wait a minute, does this jive with what I know of the character of God? Well, if it doesn't, then what is it doing to shock you and to have you see this from a different perspective? So let's start with the Isaiah passage and this uh, wonderful notion of this fabulous feast that God has set for all the people, privileging the poor and the outcast. Set this banquet and it's the, the repeated use of, of the fine foods and the wine, the fine wine, the fine wine that has been strained clear. This, it's a fabulous, fabulous banquet. And at this banquet, God will wipe away every tear and comfort everyone because God is going to conquer death. You can see how that's a great setup for Christian theology, right? So then we have this passage from Jesus talking about this another parable. And this is the last of three parables that we've been looking at. And they're, told, they're right here in a row. And he's in the temple in Jerusalem as he's telling these parables. And we need to remember who these are geared to. So yes, he's talking to the gathered people, but he's also really talking to the religious authorities in the temple. So when you look at it from that perspective, you've got this king, which we presume is God, because in all the previous ones it was the, the king was God, is show, giving this big banquet, a wedding banquet for the wedding of his son. So this is not a tiny deal. This is a really big deal. And remember, this was an honor-shame society, so you've been honored by the invitation. If you don't accept it, you are shaming the person who invited you, and shaming the king is never a good idea. People know this. You don't try to shame your leaders because they have the power and they can kill you. But that's what these people did, right? Whoever the people were, who they said, nope, nope, we're not going to do that. And the king was enraged because they, even, they didn't just not come. They killed the, the messenger. And then the king tells his, his servants to go out and invite everybody because the food is ready. The oxen and the fatted calves have been slaughtered and, and prepared. This is... 2,000 years ago, there is no refrigeration. You cannot do anything but eat that food. And so bring everybody in, bring everybody in. And everybody comes in and they have a great feast, the end. Isn't that where we want to end the story? <laughs> Leave out that whole part about the guest who's not wearing the wedding robe and gets thrown into the outer darkness. What's that about? Well, I was thinking this morning about, uh, I was very lucky when I was in ninth grade, I got to go uh, on a tour with my aunt and uncle who were chaperoning college students. My aunt and uncle, my cousins. So I, my cousins were my age. We, uh, and we went to Greece, Turkey, Egypt, Morocco, and Spain. So around the Mediterranean. And I remember there were, there were famous churches and famous mosques, and sometimes they were in the same building. You know, what, it was a church, it was converted to a mosque, or vice versa. And there was certain rules. 
So if you're going to go into a mosque, you had to take off your shoes because that is their custom. Now, at some of the bigger mosques with lots and lots of traffic, like where the cruise ships go, they had these little slippers that you put over your shoes and that satisfied the, the requirement. But you had to put those little slippers on before you went into the building as a sign of respect for the people there and their faith because it's what you do in that space to, to keep it holy. In a similar way, um, I know when I was in seminary, we, went to, we, went, we visited a mosque for a service, and the uh, women are supposed to wear a skirt. And if you're wearing pants, don't worry about it. There's a whole box of elastic waistband and tie waistband skirts over here so that you can still come in and, and scarf so you can cover your head and do all the things you're supposed to do. I don't know what the boys had to do. They, they were in another part because this was a very strict mosque that we visited. But it was provided. Oh, well, golly gee, they provided <coughs> slippers or they provided a a skirt or, or, or whatever, because they were being hospitable, right? This king has invited everybody. He's being hospitable. So perhaps the issue is the gentleman who wasn't wearing a wedding robe just said, no, I'm not wearing that, and was very disrespectful. OK, that's a little better, but thrown into the outer darkness? How about just kick him out? Not throw him in the outer darkness, bound hand and foot. Oh, wait, wait, maybe the issue is uh, less literal than what we're thinking. Let's get less literal and more metaphorical, because this is a parable after all. Do you remember a few weeks ago we talked about at the award ceremony, people don't say, oh, I love your dress. They say, oh, who are you wearing, right? What designer are you wearing? And we talked about, as Christians, we are called to put on Christ, right? Oh, I'm wearing Jesus, right? That's what we're supposed to be wearing. Well, so if you add that to this parable, if we're supposed to be wearing, because this is God's banquet, we're going to God's banquet, how should we act at God's banquet? Should we be putting on the wedding robe of the son of the king? Should we be putting on Christ to come to the banquet? The, the attitude and the mind of Christ as best as we are able. Oh, okay. So let's get more metaphorical. So God calls a whole bunch of people and invites them to the banquet. And a bunch of them say, nope, 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 nope. And that ends in death. That's the natural consequence of saying no to the living God who brings you life. If you say no to God, the natural consequence is death. In the Old Testament, there's that uh, repeated phrase. God says, I put before you the ways of life and death. Choose life that you may live usually in context of following the Ten Commandments or something similar. I put before you the ways of life and death. Choose life that you may live. So the people who didn't respond to the invitation chose death because they said no to God in a really rude way, <laughs> right? Killing the wet messengers. And then what about the people who say, yeah, I'll come to the banquet, but then they don't follow Christ? <clears throat> hmm. We know Jesus uses this word a lot to describe the religious authorities. What does he use? That, that derogatory term that it still describes them, people who say one thing and do the opposite. What do we call them? Hypocrites. hypocrites, exactly. <clears throat> so the hypocrites are not wearing the wedding robe. And that's not okay either. Many are, call many are called, but few are chosen. 
well, who's doing the choosing here? We like to think it's God, and we have no power over it whatsoever. But to whom has God extended the invitation? Everyone, absolutely everyone. Oh, so who's choosing to accept the invitation or reject the invitation? That's us. Oh, no, Kim, Pastor Kim, personal responsibility? We have to, we have to be a part of our salvation? We have to choose to follow God and do our best to follow in the path of Jesus Christ? Can we just do it on Sundays? Will that work? No. No, that won't work. Uh, Saturday and Sunday? No. Uh, five days a week? No. Seven days a week? Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> We've made a commitment by joining the church, by, by claiming Christ, we've made a commitment, a choice. And we are called to continue to do our best in this world, the best that we can in a world that is full of upheaval and, and where evil shines through way too many ways in way too many places. We are called to follow Jesus, we are called to love, we are called to justice, we are called to peace, we are called to compassion. We are called to be as strong as we can be and in everything that we do, use the power that we have, however little or great our power is, we are called to use it to serve God, to love God by loving our neighbors, which is everybody. Now, there's the backdrop of this past week, right? And the difficulties of figuring out how do we respond. One thing I would re re ask all of you to do, um, any friends of yours, even acquaintances you know who are Jewish, mm -hmm. reach out to them. They are experiencing such an huge uptick in anti-Semitism. Any friends or acquaintances you know who are Muslim, they are also suffering. Reach out and just let them know, hey, I don't even know what to say, but I want you to know that I support your existence. I don't support those who want to wipe either of these people off the face of the earth. That's one concrete thing you can do. To be part of trying to find a way forward. Because we live where we live and we can do what we can do where we are. And at the same token, we are called in this season, and this is the only time I'm gonna talk about it, there's an election coming up, right? We live in a country where we get to vote. That's a power that we have. So look over your ballot. Think about the different things we're voting on, the people, and put that in your mind following Christ as you cast your ballot. That's a way you can exercise your power for the betterment of the world. So as we figure out what we can do in our daily lives, in things that happen once a year or, or once a month or whatever, how can we embody Christ, put on the mind of Christ, put on that wedding robe of the Son of God, so that we are choosing to follow God, to love God, to love our neighbors, to love ourselves, to work for peace and justice wherever we can, in whatever tiny ways we can in the world. That's what we're called to do. And I hope 
And I pray that you will all make that commitment so that we can bring a little bit of the kingdom of God to this place. And I know that you, when you do it, it does happen. You create a thin place. And God is there with you. God is wiping away every tear and laying a banquet for the whole world. We're called to help invite people to the feast and encourage them to accept the invitation. And the main thing that you're accepting is that following the way of Christ. It's not some dogma or some creed, but following that way of Christ. And when we do that, it does change the world. Even if it's just a little bit, it all adds up. And that is the good news. Hallelujah. Amen. start the prayer today uh, with a, a prayer written by Rabbi Sheila Weiberg from the Jewish community of Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, so giving her credit ahead of time. And um, now that we're, we're at the time of prayer, where we lift up our joys and our concerns for what shall we pray this day? Mary? Janine. Here's a thanksgiving for a dear, sweet young lady named Choir. Uh, and the children, and that book has been written about, a model wrote a book about her. She and her mom did it together. She lives in our community, and she has Down syndrome. And she's amazing light, spirit, and love in our community. So prayers for thanksgiving for Choir. What's her name? Mary Terrio.
was her, the daughter's name? Kylie. Kylie. Beth. For your daughter's friend? Our daughter and her friend. And her friend, okay. Yes. A joy, okay. squeezing it on the bottom of the page. All right. Let us be a people at prayer. <clears throat> Two people, one land, three faiths, one root, one earth, one mother, one sky, one beginning, one future, one destiny, one broken heart, one God. We pray to you, grant us a vision of unity. May we see the many in the one and the one in the many. May you, life of all the worlds, source of all amazing differences, Help us to see clearly. Guide us gently and firmly toward each other, toward peace. We lift our prayer to you this day, O oh God, for peace in our world. There is so much turmoil, <clears throat> so much bloodshed, so many war crimes. We human beings have a hard time playing by the rules. But you keep inviting us. You invite us to the banquet of life, the banquet that can feed us all from your abundance. Help us to accept that invitation wholeheartedly to rest in the comfort of your presence, to go out into the world seeking to do your will, a will of peace, and justice, compassion and kindness, tenderness and mercy. Give us discernment that we may know where the path lies when the terrain gets jumbled and confused and rocky. Help us to focus on your Son, Jesus Christ, on the way he lived his life, the way he died, and the way he rose again.
Help us to follow through on our commitment to you. We lift to you this day the family of Martha Dorr, who passed away this week. We lift to you thanksgiving for stories about amazing people who are light and love in the world, like, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, Kaiwa? Kwaya. Kwaya. And her mother, who wrote the story down. We ask prayers for Sue and Michael Lysenscher, whose daughter was killed. We lift up Kaylee to your tender care. We lift up all the people in the Middle East who are suffering and grieving and confused and hurt and angry. Protect especially, O oh God, the children. Help wisdom visit all the leaders on all sides so that we can realize as a world that there aren't really sides. We ask traveling mercies for Beth's daughter and her friend returning from Spain. We ask help and comfort for Colleen's oldest brother, Edward, as he goes through a very hard time. And we lift up the joy of seeing a granddaughter at a field hockey game. We are thankful for the tender mercies you have given us, O oh God. And we bring our broken hearts to you, knowing that you seek to mend them, to wipe away every tear. We know this because your commitment runs so deep that you gave us your only son. And so we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, Our Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. offering will now be received and the two that have been asked please come help
We're going to dedicate these, and then I missed a prayer. Holy God, we serve, serve you, you with, with our, our gifts of, of money, time, compassion, compassion and prayer. prayer. Send your spirit upon all these gifts and guide us to use them to further your will here on earth. Amen. Wait a second, wait a second. I'm gonna, I, I missed a prayer request, so I need to pop over. Okay, so uh, Roz asked prayers for Ronnie to have good results from this week's testing of great import. Uh, and and Anna and Nancy, we both pray that our dear friend June has a comforting guide on her journey to heaven. Oh God, hear our prayer. Now we're going to sing. <laughs> God's call to be blessed guests at the feast. May you be guided by God's love in everything you do, every day of the week. And may that make a difference in this world. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.